I actually think that her nomination is in more jeopardy than people understand right now. And I think the reason for this is this, this issue with Katanji Brown Jackson's 25 year record of advocating for leniency, actually even ordering lenient sentences for people who are child sex predators is starting to get out into the bloodstream despite the best efforts of Democrats to say that talking about her record is racist and sexist. Apparently she's a woman again, because we're sexist for talking about her record. And, uh, you know, and it's a smear to talk about a record. Look, let's look at the difference between what's going on here and what happened with Justice Kavanaugh. I, I helped re run that confirmation for Chairman Grassley. We're not, we're not creeping through anyone's high school yearbooks. We're not bringing up false allegations from 35 years ago when someone was 17 years old. We're, we're not doing any of that. We are doing a deep dive at the Article 3 project into Judge Katanji Brown Jackson's 25-year legal record at Harvard Law School. She published a note for the Harvard Law Review arguing essentially that sex offender registries are unconstitutionally punitive. When she went to the Sentencing Commission in 2000. 10 to 2014 as vice chair, President Obama appointed her as vice chair, uh, and they're hiding her records. There are 48,000 pages of her records from the Obama White House, from, from the archives, from her nominations to both the Sentencing Commission and to the District Court. And I, I, I'm starting to understand why as we talk about this. The, if you look at her, what she did at the, as vice chair of the Sentencing Commission, she, was, uh, she served as the tip of the spear to gen up the Sentencing Commission to look in uh, these, uh, these uh, sentences for people who possess and distribute child pornography. Uh, no one was asking for this. It didn't come from Congress. It didn't come from the Attorney General. It didn't come from other judges. It was Judge Jackson. And the transcripts that we looked at, particularly, particularly around the 2012 timeframe, make this very clear, that she made this her personal advocacy, her, her, her pet project. And we have the research documents at Article 3 Project. We put out two research documents where we did the deep dive. And what we saw was at the Sentencing Commission, as, as all of you probably know, they, they are the ones who do the sentencing guidelines. They, they make recommendations to Congress and to federal prosecutors about the appropriate sentencing ranges for various federal crimes. And Congress imposed a five-year mandatory minimum sentence for people who possess and distribute child pornography because too many judges, too many prosecutors were going weak on this issue. Um, and this is 10 years ago. Uh, Judge Jackson says, well, it was back when we had mail versus internet. You saw that at the hearing, it's, that's just bonkers. It's, she has it backwards. We should have greater sentences now because of the internet being all over the world and people having smartphones with cameras. The proliferation of child pro pornography means it's much easier to exploit these kids. And it happens all the time. Remember child pornography is child rape. These kids could not consent. And these, you know, we use euph euphemisms like non-producers. That's what uh, Judge Jackson calls the people who sit around and watch the child rape versus who actually do it. And then we talk about images and the number of images don't matter. Remember those images are kids getting raped. So let's just call a spade a spade here. Judge Jackson in 2012 didn't think that these uh, this five-year mandatory minimum sentence for these, uh, these uh, people, these non-producers, as she called them, these people who watch child pornography was, uh, she thought it was too mean. She thought it was too harsh. And so she made it her mission. We have transcripts where she called experts into the sentencing commission in 2012, a Columbia a medical school psychiatrist and then a federal prosecutor. And she came up with this hypothesis. She asked it as a question. Uh, it was essentially these people who watch child pornography are not pedophiles. So therefore they're not as dangerous to the community. So therefore we shouldn't put them in prison for as long as we do. That's her, that's her so-called theory um, that she said was a question. Both the experts, the psychiatrist from Columbia and the federal prosecutor uh, said, no, 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 no. These are pedophiles and they're dangerous, right? And she disregarded, she ignored, disregarded that expert testimony. She made a key finding in her 2012 report for the Sentencing Commission that said that these child pornographers are not pedophiles and they're not as dangerous and therefore we shouldn't punish them as hard as we do. Federal judges all over the country have, have cited to this as a reason to, to do downward departures for, for child pornography. And we saw this, she carried this onto the bench. Uh, she had you know, eight years on the bench. She had about 100 
sentences of federal criminals, federal felons, a high number of them, I think it was around 10, were, were uh, people who involved in child pornography. Seven of those are cases where she had discretion. And in all seven cases, she sentenced at the rock bottom. Uh, and so it's a, it's a weird pattern. And then let's look at how this pattern played out for one of these cases with Hawkins. Hawkins was the guy, Wesley Hawkins was the guy, poor 18 year old kid, she claimed. She was the, he was the victim too. He was watching child pornography, a lot of child pornography. And the sentencing guidelines recommended minimally eight years in prison. She gave him three months. She also gave 70, I think it was 73 months of supervised release, which is essentially what in the federal system is essentially probation, but we got rid of probation. So three months in prison instead of eight years, 73 months of supervised release, but she didn't order computer supervision like you're supposed to do in these cases. So those pe these people don't go back to their computers and start looking at child pornography again. Well, guess what Mr. Hawkins did, right? He got nabbed again within the time that he should have been in prison within that eight years, uh, within that time that he should have had computer monitoring if, if she had ordered it within that 73 years of supervised release and he got nabbed again and got sent back to jail again for six months for, for being a child predator online. So it's a dangerous pattern. And I actually think that this is starting to resonate. It's starting to break through to real America instead of the nerds like us who watch this stuff every day and you know think these Supreme Court hearings are Super Bowls for us. It's starting to break out to the real world. And I think that's why they're going to try to jam this nomination through as quickly as we can. And at Article 3 Project, I've been doing as much media as possible. At, at a minimum, this is going to be a painful vote for Democrats. Mike, that's... That was that was great and, and same. Uh, I really appreciate y'all's insight, uh, particularly from you know not just where you sit now, but where you used to sit uh, in the chamber. Uh, frankly, um, go ahead and jump into some questions. Uh, and you you got into this a little bit more, but I'd, I'd pose it to, to both of you. You know, uh, what's the difference between a judicial methodology and a judicial philosophy? Well, uh, Judge Jackson um, described uh, what she seemed to present as her distinctive methodology as first she would get the first step, she would get in a mindset to be impartial. Second set, uh, second step, she would look at the um, at, at the the arguments of the parties uh, and, and, and the facts of the case. Third step, she would apply the law. Uh, you know, this is this is the distinctive methodology. Um, like I think we, when we talk about judicial philosophy, we're talking about how do you go about interpreting a legal text? Uh, as a, a text does not interpret itself, we all recognize that there are um, uh, provisions of the Constitution that uh, that are vague or ambiguous in some way. Indeed, I would argue that that uh, every provision of the Constitution, even those that are um, often said to be set forth clear rules. Uh, actually require resort to public meaning originalism in order to know what they mean. Take something as simple as the requirement that the uh, president must be 35. How do we know that's 35 and base 10? Uh, we, 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 we know that, and, and the, the proper answer to that question is we, we, we go back and we, 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 we uh, of course, we all understand that base 10 was a predominant method um, uh, in the 18th century as well. Uh, but but if, if if that were ever disputed, we would you know we we would go back and 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 establish that and and you know if it turned out that that um, you know that that um, base eight was being used back then, then that provision would mean something very different to us. So um, there's there's always going to be uh, interpretation of legal texts, and it requires um, some sort of uh, methodology or philosophy is required. I think a methodology might. You know, one might use that word more to how you carry out um, a, a a judicial philosophy. One can, you know, one can use those terms somewhat interchangeably. But uh, Katanji Brown Jackson was describing her methodology, um, you know, in a very um, mundane way. Uh, actually, I, I took note today that um, back in 2009, when Sonia Sotomayor described uh, her biography, uh, I'm sorry, her um, philosophy in the same way. A, a lefty Georgetown law professor slammed her as, as you know, intellectually unqualified, um, you know, for the position for offering such a simplistic view of what um, the judicial role involves. 
I would say that her judicial philosophy, well, let's look at her record. I'm, I'm to, to show you two glaring examples of her judicial philosophy. In 2015, Judge Jackson's on the DC District Court and there was a case before her with uh, Hillary Clinton's press secretary's work emails that, uh, that he was using his personal email account for. So those are clearly subject to the Freedom of Information Act, except for in Judge Jackson's courtroom because she, she uh, convoluted the Freedom of Information Act to protect from disclosure and embarrassment these emails, right, from Hillary Clinton's press secretary, again, doing work emails on his personal computer, personal email. Those are clearly subject to FOIA. Fast forward a mere four years, and she, in 2019, she eviscerates 230 years of constitutional law on executive privilege, going back to George Washington to, uh, to order Don McGahn, the White House counsel, to testify against President Trump. If there's anyone, there are two people in the White House who enjoy executive privilege uh, with the president, and that would be the White House chief of staff and the White House counsel. If anyone else, uh, if they don't enjoy it, executive privilege has no meaning. Well, she was uh, reversed, and then the case was eventually settled uh, on appeal. Uh, including by Democrat judges, but it, it just shows that she's willing to go out of her way to protect clearly disclosable records from Democrats and go out of her way to try to get Donald Trump on something as serious as exec executive privilege. So that's uh, one data point. I would just say that it seems to me that her judicial philosophy is just getting to a liberal result. Uh, and you know, she can't talk about her judicial philosophy because she can't be honest about it. Um, she also talks about the empathy standard. Democrats are, you know, they talk about the empathy standard. So look, look at her cases, look at her pet project, look at, look at where she shows empathy. We showed that she shows empathy for sex predators of kids, number one. And then we also saw in her, uh, over her career, when she went out of her way, after she was a federal defender, when she was in private practice, she went out of her way at MOFA, Morrison and Forrester, to provide her Supreme Court clerkship and uh, Harvard Law degree and her many years of experience to get more detainees. And she, they weren't even her clients, so she can't say she was representing clients. She was representing former judges. She advocated all the way to the Supreme Court on behalf of uh, her clients, the former liberal former federal judges, and she advocated successfully in a five to four decision uh, written by Justice Kennedy, joined by the four liberals to provide, in 2008, to provide essentially habeas rights to get more detainees. Um, since this time, 729 have been released from Gitmo, 229 have been have returned to terrorist activities, and 12 have killed six Americans. So if Democrats now think it's acceptable to go after Republican lawyers, 100 Republican lawyers around the country for representing 2020 election challengers, it's certainly fair game to question her judgments uh, for representing uh, uh, the position of these Gitmo terrorists.